This meeting is being recorded. Good evening and welcome to Trust News here. Uh, I'm Colin O'Rourke and tonight we welcome Michael Fortune to Trust News here once again. Uh, tonight's topic is St. Bridget and the coming of sp uh, spring. I know we're a week late, but we, we had to invite Michael on because he shared a fantastic uh, amount of information last week regarding the St. Bridget. Uh, regarding St. Bridget's Day and, of course, the cross. Um, so we invited Michael to come on and join us. Anyone here that's that's new to Trasting is here. Um, this meeting is, sorry, this lecture is being recorded. Uh, it's going to be uploaded possibly tonight or tomorrow onto our YouTube channel, Trasting is here. If you're also interested, we have about 160 other lectures there dating back over the last two years. So it's all there for you to view. Now, I'm going to pass you over to Michael. He's going to discuss the uh, the heritage and customs based around St. Bridget, and uh, he'll also talk about the St. Bridget's Cross. So over to you now, Michael. Great. Thanks a million, Colin, and um, thanks for having me. Uh, listen, folks, uh, yeah, um, what about... Let me see now. I'm just going to... No. I'm going to look at myself here now. No. So, come here. Um, can you all see me, Colin? Can everyone see me, yeah? Is all, is all working? Yeah. 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 Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Good stuff. Listen, hi, hi, all folks. And uh, yeah, listen, what I want to do is I want to give you a good 45 to 50 minute chat around St. Bridget's Day. And um, what I want to do in particular, I'm, uh, I live here in County Wexford. I, um, I'm an artist come from a kind of a video film background and kind of, I kind of moved naturally into the, into the area of folklore just by from the upbringing that I, that, I, that I grew up with, where I suppose customs and beliefs and a, a huge interest in people and, and places and the things we do and holding, I suppose, holding a mirror up to people's lives and some ways holding up a mirror to lives of people that would normally get get, get a, a mirror held, held up to them. Um, and I suppose this chat about Bridget is really a reflection and looking at how, I suppose, people in Ireland all over the country uh, mark the day um, and remembered the person. Um, and um, so it's not an academic thing about an, an academic presentation about the life of Bridget. It's more about what, the things that we do to mark this particular woman. And as you will know already, St. Bridget's Day has passed. Um, the start of spring was on the 1st of February. And uh, come next year, St. Bridget will be one of our, uh, will be a, a paid, um, will be, there'll be a national holiday de dedicated to, her in, Ireland, to, her, to her, her in Ireland. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to share um, my screen here with your first, right? And I'm going to show you, I'm going to go between image, I'm going to keep this really relaxed for you folks, right? I'm going to go between images and videos for you, right? And just to give you a little bit of a flavor. But as I said to you, what I do is really, I hold up a mirror to people, right? And in my case, the mirror to people is a true video camera or true photography. So a lot of digital, digital material. The idea of collecting, recording and sharing, and sharing is really important. And one of the things which is supposed for me in my own practice, and which you'll see here as well, is the idea of sharing, sharing generates more conversations as well. Um, and especially with the advent of these things here, mobile phones, we can actually get source material. And that's really, really important in this whole area of work, this idea of actually being able to access source material digitally, remotely, and um, that we couldn't have done before. And that's a really interesting thing. And it's a really interesting thing for putting um, hearing devices of people. Come here to me. Uh, St. Bridget, now, I, I, I came across this, she's one of the three patron saints, right? We're, we're talking uh, 451 to 525 is the, is the, is the, the classic St. Bridget that we're basing our St. Bridget's Day on. Now there's arguments that it's a different St. Bridget before us, a goddess that existed. I don't know, and it's sometimes when we get lost in the depths of time, sometimes we will never really understand it. But all I can say is poor Oaks, Column, uh, Column Kill is feeling a little, a little bit left a, li a little bit left out. Um, but. Bridget is there. It's a fantastic move for Ireland. It's a fantastic move for the world to have a one of our. It's it, it's been a long, long time coming. Um. Now the other day I sat down to myself and I said, God, there's going to be some crack next year. Name and name and Bridget. So I I I put up in the folklore.ie page that I run. I said, right, many different bridges do we know? So even just to just to run this by you, what this person means to to different people. You have Bridgets and. Bridges with G DGs and Bridges and we got Biddies and Breeds and Bree Jeans and Brides and Brideys and Breeds and Budgies and Bud and Bids and Brudge and Brudges, Simple Bees and Brodies and Breeders. There's loads, right? There's, and it's, there's probably another five or ten names I could add to that. So this person exists. She's very, very strong. Her name is very, very strong. Was very, very strong in our, our kind of our, our, our canon of names of, of general Catholic names in particular in Ireland. It faded a little bit back in the sixties and seventies. A little bit where names, more kind of Celtic revival names, took kind of took precedent. But it's really interesting to watch out. Actually, within our travelling community, they kept the name Bridget going, and actually that's where you probably find the strongest 
number of bridges in Ireland at, the, at present are within the, within the traveling community because they, they they follow a, a very traditional name name and uh, name and pattern of being named after grandparents and grandmothers in particular. So that's the there's there's a little general overview of Bridget, but the general story of Bridget, which we all grew up with, and I suppose coming through primary schools in, in 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 Ireland, was the story of Saint Bridget and her, Bridget and her cloak. Now here's my other half and our little one singing a song that. Has, um, a singer, our singer or a poet called Catherine Ann Cullen from County Loud wrote two years ago and for a project of ours called Songs for Our Children. And what's surprising, there were, are some songs about Bridget, but there were no songs about that particular story that so many of us grew up with. And it's a lovely little child friendly song. And I'm going to press play on this for you, right? Because this will tell you the classic story about St. Bridget. The classic story that we hear. There was a wise woman, we're all agreed. Some call her Bridget, some call her Breed. She grew up kind and she liked a joke, and she always wore a wee small cloak. About 1500 years ago, this strong young woman to Kildare did go. To build a church made the common folk with her four best friends and her wee small cloak. Now the King of Leinster had fields galore, so Bridget went knocking on his castle door. Would you give us a field by the old oak tree to build a church for my friends and me? Well, the mean old king, he gave a roar, saying, what kind of fool do you take me for? Because nobody gets as rich as me by giving their fields to the poor for free. So Bridget smiled, would you grant instead the land as far as my cloak will spread? The king laughed loudly at her joke, cause she wouldn't cover much with her wee small cloak. To see how far the cloak would reach, her four best friends took a corner each. When she shouted go, they all set forth, walking east and west and south and north. The king was so mad he began to choke, and out of his ears came books of smoke. His mean old heart it nearly broke, when he saw the measure of Bridget's cloak. But his heart was changed by Bridget's power, and his men built her chapel with a tall bell tower. Now they call it Kildare, the church of the oak, on the land that was covered by Bridget's cloak. Now, there's the story of Bridget's cloak for you. It's this kind of story that most of us would have grown up with through primary schools here in Ireland in the 70s and 80s and probably well before that before that as well. It's interesting actually folks, the, the, the role and the female role, as you can see there with my, my wife and my daughter singing that song. Um, this is outside my grandmother's house in Wexford actually. And it's interesting the role of women in this in the story of Bridget in Ireland and um, whether we learned how to make, I remember learning how to make my first St. Bridget's Crosses from a female teacher in in a, in, a, in a school in Ballygarrett in County Wexford. And I'm sure that was the same for so many of us, predominantly most of our school teachers are, 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 are women. And it's an interesting, even my own grandmother, this was me making a cross with her when she was a hundred at a time. This is 2013, I think, 101 at a time. So I remember even growing up, to make to make crosses was always a big thing, but it was always a strong female as, aspect around the day. Um, and to be fair, as many as you probably will know yourselves, folks, St. Bridget kind of left St. Patrick in the Haveney place when it came to around the customs and the folklore and the, way, the things that we did ar ar around the day, how we marked the day. Now, obviously, as you know yourselves, the day, whether you call it Bridget or St. Bridget, but that's up to yourselves. The stories are the stories. And we all know that St. Bridget's Day is based around the first of the first day of spring. It's a, the start of the, of, of, the of, 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 of spring and it's the end of winter. So it's tied in with that kind of turn in the year where the earth's awakening again and life is growing up all around us. And we'll touch on that later on. But the idea of, uh, of making the crosses was lovely. It always got me the idea of this 
private thing always got me, was always really st struck me. The idea of being able to walk into a field, in a wet field, to pick rushes, in a, 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 right, or bring them in, in, a, in, a, in a bag into the classroom, you know, and make them and make the mess, that always got me. It always appealed to me more than the, 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 tra the tractors of St. Patrick's Day and the parades, which never really excited me at all. I suppose if you're born and bred in the country, that, you know, that, a town's a town, you know. So to me, it was, that, that, that was very different. So it was, I always liked the, the the, 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 the very personal aspect to this day, and I hope we don't lose sight of that in, 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 in the time going forward as well. It's even interesting, and again, I, this is not going to be some, it'll be a very quick overview for you, but even just to let you look at, we looked at names, Bridget, earlier on. Our school's folklore scheme is a fantastic resource, especially the fact now that we can word search it. Now, I'm always constantly recording, and I've, I've, I've seen names here in the audience, and they're doing the exact same as well, and everyone is doing it in their own part of the country. Um, but this is a great one for to look at the names, where she pops up. Um, again, the name and where she's marked. Very, very strong in, I found the Northwest, in Donegal in particular, Dun Bridget is very, very strong. And even when I was recording folklore, and Donegal, I will get more layers to the stories around Bridget. Now, probably you would have got the same stories in Fermanagh, maybe Derry, but that's that partition didn't help that, and the school's folklore scheme wasn't done wasn't done in the six counties. Now that was a big, big, a, a big, a big loss. And um, but one of the great things is the word searchability, which is fantastic, right? An interesting one for you out there now, because I know again, this is all. They're all stories, folks, as far as I can see, right? And whatever, you know, no one's story is better than anyone else's story. And that's how, how we mark it. And, you know, this day or this person can be many things to everyone, right? Um, which is great. But even just on a pure technical thing, the, the words in bullet don't really turn up. They don't turn up in the vernacular. They'll turn up near the medieval manuscripts and in the last maybe couple of decades. And for my just from my field record and working with people, the older people that I would record would never even heard of the term, right? It's there now, it's part of it's part of that that story around the start around the around the, the start of spring. It was there before and but it was lost in time. It was lost in time, but it's back there again. And if it means something to someone, fair Jews, right? I'm gonna show you some footage from people from Donegal. And again, all these lads, come here to me, all these things are layers, layers upon layers upon layers. No one's right, no one's wrong. One thing which kind of an, always annoys me a bit in folklore, and I find it sometimes, people try to come back and try to find the answers, the answers in time. And sometimes they want to go back and find the answers, and in doing so, to remove all those lovely layers in the, in the process, right? It's almost like someone handed someone a dot-to-dot -dot picture of an elephant, and when, you hand, when they hand it back to you, they made a cat's face, right? Because they've made, they have their own vision in their own head, what they want the history to be, what they want to fit their narratives and their stories. And I find that a little bit of, of late, and I hope we, you know, we don't lose sight of the people that are, that are around us and what they remember and what they did. That's really important in this, in particular this age we're living in now, the actual art of conversation, the art of talking and the art of digging around and asking people around you, what did you do? So here's some uh, women from Donegal for you, just to show you some little layers and lovely layers. And here's some of the accents as well. This was recorded in 2010. Um, this stuff would be, some of the stuff would be available on my YouTube page and my, on folk, Michael Fortune or folklore.ie. I'll let you have a little listen. Well, in our area, the, the St. Bridget's Cross are made on the, on the feast of St. the eve of St. Bridget's. And uh, you would gather now, the, I know some neighbours would gather together in one house and uh, somebody would go out and say a prayer, you know, before you come into the house carrying the rushes with them. And during the cross making, they would have poundies, which is mashed potatoes and onions and butter, lovely butter. Mm -hmm. And then there'll be a cross made for sort of the house and also for all the outhouses outside, you know, the buyers or the stable for the horse or, you know, places like that there to protect the animals throughout the year as well. That's the general yeah, idea, yeah, you know, yeah. to mean kind of a thing, you know. And if there's any old person in the area that wouldn't be able to make one, you know, you do extra ones for them or whatever, like, you know. Yes, well, I would normally, I still make them when I would cut the rushes off. There was some around the garden, which is planted, and uh, on the night before the 31st, and I would make my crosses that evening, and I would put them out before bedtime, before 12, and I would have a little bit of cloth, or some set of white scar, and I would put it on, I would put them all into a bowl, and put a big stone top them, so it was a stormy night, they wouldn't blow away, and leave them out on the windowsill. All night, and some bridge would come during the night and bless them. And then the cloth would have, if you had done any sores or that during the year, sore throats or any sores, especially with children, that we'd rub this little bit of cloth on them. You yeah. used to have to cut the rushes, the head of the house normally did that, before the sun went down. 
on the 31st of January. Mm -hmm. And then he came to the back door and he called out for the people in the house to go on their knees and to welcome St. Bridget in. And he called out three times and the household answered. And then he opened the door, came in, and then we waited until the sun was well set. We had poundies first. You had the shave of brushes under the table. And then after that, when you had the meal, everybody tied a few rushes around their head, banned something to do with headaches. And then you made so many crosses, depending on how many buyers you had. If you had an old neighbor that didn't make ones, you would make ones for them as well. And we'd normally bless them. Somebody in the house would bless them themselves. But now it's the custom taken to the church. Not at that time, when I was growing up. I'm going to end it there for you folks, right? Absolutely lovely content there um, from, from, from those women. Just, just gorgeous stuff. And when I, every time I listen to what I hear, I hear different things. I love the words, the sheaf. I love the idea of the, 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 the rushes being called and brought into the house. I, I love the clear, the clear description of sunset. And, when, you know, that was the time when it went from uh, the 31st, the eve of St. Bridget's Day, very, very important time in Irish folklore, very important around our May Day customs, very important around our um, our Halloween customs as well. That kind of, that space when it's going from light into dark, into the dark of the night, very, very important. And that cro that could crop up. But there's lovely rituals there and, load, and loads more as well to add, add to that. Um, the idea that the mention of the, of the, of, of the cloth, that the brat breed, I'll touch on this in a second with you, but one of the things which I mentioned was the idea of making the crosses and bringing them to an elderly neighbour. That's all part of a kind of a, a social fabric that it, it just was a kind of, it's, it's an accepted thing that many of us grow up with. At, ho at Christmas time, you'd bring older neighbours to ho Holly, you know, likewise if someone couldn't go to somewhere, you'd bring them back something. And that's lovely to see. And that's a really important thing to see in, in this. Here's a photograph from a woman down the road from me here called Stella Burns, got a gorgeous dresser. But if you can see over the door here, where I'm hovering over on the right hand side, she's got her St. Bridget's cross. Now, some people would hang, put a St. Bridges cross up and they would put a new one up the following year and burn the old one. There are loads of different rituals. None are right or wrong. And I keep, have to keep saying that none are right or wrong, right? Even like the, the blessed palm, but the idea of bringing something green into the house at this time of year, the idea of replenishing something. Um, but one thing which is really important and you see it it'll crop up an awful lot is height was always important. Even classic things like a sacred heart picture was on a height. The, the St. Bridges cross was over a door. It was over a threshold. It was up in the rafters of the house all to do with protection. It was putting the buyers of the house all to do with protection. And this is cross, cross. I find it here, my expert anyway is cross, is, is cross religious. You know, I find Church of Ireland neighbours of mine would still have a Bridges cross, you know. So uh, it's not predominantly a Catholic thing, even though St. Bridget is there, it, it's, it, it, it's celebrated there. There's, there's, there's a lot of a, a crossover a crossover there and, it's, there's, and more of it, I'd say, will, will happen in, in, in time. So that's a really interesting one to watch out. But those, the crosses over the height were always important. One thing, even just, this is my little one, out getting rushes always to get rushes as the woman in Donegal said you get the rushes that evening before before the sun would set and then as she was saying what you would do is you'd bring the rushes in the youngest of the house would bring them in I never grew up doing this but I'm doing it now because we've got kids of our own and these are little things and even these, these are just snaps of my little one three years ago there she is two years ago and there she is only a couple of, only a week ago so it's lovely just to see that kind of even that continuation of that kind of house-based stuff and that's coming across really strong that's a really good gauge I can find it on social media find it through going through schools is that connection to the, to the to the to the home which is important and again parking the religious things there parking the stories side but the idea one well, actually one of the ideas i actually really like about it is the idea of bringing crafts you know I, I, the bridget was for i suppose it was an a to z of bridget she was the patron saint of brewers and beekeepers there's so many things she was a patron in ireland she was a patron saint of you know but i love the idea that she's related to arts and crafts and related to uh making you know and that's uh, that's a really lovely thing again which i think is a really a, a, it's a great thing to, to see and to witness. Years of my own little one making crosses, getting them all bowways and stuff. But that's part of it. That's the, the, the lovely thing about it and making them with their grandfather as well. So, and again, one of the things which you, you, you probably may have done yourselves is the idea was that the crosses would be left out on the 31st. That's a kind of common one around the country. The crosses or rushes were collected, they were made that night and were left out. And the idea was they were left out then for, as the women Donegal said, for breed to bless, right? Now, sometimes you can leave them out outside and 
the, the idea was that Breed, a bridge had come that night and blessed them. They were also left out, actually, St. Bridges' crosses were left out on All Saints' night as well, because they believe that the saints travelled th th that night as well, like, like All Souls' night. That, 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 that's, that was the story. But I've come across, of, of late, someone telling me that they'd leave them out on the bonnet of a car. And you know what? It's actually really practical, because, you know, what? we've all got these flat spaces outside our houses, and waking up tables, but we've got the bonnet of a car. One of the things as well, which uh, is becoming more and more popular, is the story around the, of the Bridget's, Bridget's cloak. And it's the, the classic story that was in the song there. But the idea that a blue uh, a blue cloth brat breed or brattock breed was, was, was left out uh, on that night. Some people threw it on a wash night, some people threw it in a ditch, some people wrapped up their crosses with it. But the idea that this cloak was there, and I've recorded oh, tons of people, right, will tell you, oh, one woman in Clonmel told me she got a needle in her finger once. What did she do? She got a bit of the Bridges cloak, wrapped it around it, and lo and behold, an hour later, the needle came out. That's the story, right? Here's a fantastic image and a fantastic words by a, a, an English poet, but she's got huge connections to, to Ireland, in particular to Wexford and Wicklow, um, called Winifred Letts. Um, and this is just a lovely, a lovely poem about Bridges. She was, Winifred was writing, I suppose, in the early 1900s. And the dandelion light is sparkly, Bridget finds the wayside dark, and brother wind comes, uh, comes rollicking for joy that she has brought to spring. Young lambs and their little furry, little furry folk seek shelter underneath her cloak. Absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous uh, words. And I'll share some more with you again. Winifred Letts, Winifred M. Letts is her name. She's a great poem here about, about the harbour here in Wexford, about in, in near Courtown Harbour. But it's lovely to see that story was, 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 was existing back then as well. Here's a great story. Uh, um, another Bridget told me, a Bridget, uh, a Bridget Tunney from, from Donegal. She was down with me at, in January 2020, just before COVID came. And uh, she said, I, I, she, we were talking about Bridget's cloak and she, ours was different than up in, up in, in Donegal to use a different coloured one. And she had a great story and I'm going to let you, let you listen to it. Because again, this great story about the power of this this piece of cloth, um, and I let Bridget have tell you the story herself now. I find it, and as I said to you before, before maybe I didn't say it to you. If you have any questions, pop them into the chat, and we'll be taking cute questions at the end as well. So here's Bridget. Tom. I said I noticed you have a blue one. Like well, the one that we would have at home, it would have been red flannel that we would have used, uh, and it was put out on the eve of Saint Bridget, and and the idea was that Bridget, as she passed around the house during during Bridget's Eve, she would have blessed. Sorry, we're getting a bit of... And then it was brought in and it was kept if but anybody had sore throats. We're getting a bit of slow delay back there, folks. So I'm going to try to press play again for you. Hopefully it'll work. And headaches and that sort of thing. Um, but in my my mother's time, and I was thinking it was, it was about 1930 or 31, she's about 10 or 11 at the time, there was an incident that happened. And in those days, in her home, my grandmother put out an item of clothing belonging to every member of the family. And it was put out as well as the, the Brat of Breda. Uh, and they lived by the shores of Lost Willy in Donegal. And there had been a drowning there and they couldn't find the body. So one of the men of the search party had heard that Granny had done this, that she had a, an items of clothing in the house, blessed by Bridget. So he came to the house and he asked, would she give them something? And she gave my uncle's jacket. And they took the jacket with them and they went out in the boat. And the jacket for, kind of went with the current initially and then eventually began to swirl around. And as it swirled, you know, they, they, they died to seek the and they found the body. So, you know, that's just as a story associated with, you know, with the, 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 a blessed coat by Bridget on, 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 on St. Bridget's Eve. And the men brought back the the, um, the the jacket back to my grandmother again. But that is a story my mother remembered from her childhood. And she would have been about 10 or 11 at the time. So that was early 30s. Yeah. I'm going to stop it there. Powerful story and gorgeous to listen to Bridget tell it. Um, I, I, Bridget's a great a, a great story. There's a great traditional singer, by the way, as well. And Bridget's a nun, uh, by the way, as well. I let you I just uh, for those who don't know. I think as, that's one of the things that's really important for me. I suppose in some ways, if we look back at the like the Bridgetine nuns here set up the car uh, the, the convent in Carlo and Tolo and Carlo in 18, 18, 1807. Now, when you think of what what it was like back then to be setting up religious order for Catholics back then in, in that in, our, in, our, in Ireland, so it's very interesting. And so that's a very, you know, they've been a, a, a huge part of this story. And I suppose we, we all own the story. And in particular, like there's a, 
the great work of, the, of those nuns in um, in, uh, the, in the in the, in the centre in Kildare as well. If you're looking for more more uh, more information down the line, I would recommend that the the, the, the Sullis Breed in, in County Kildare. So again, Bridget is owned by all of us, right? Bridget mentioned something though, which is interesting. She mentioned this stuff. She mentioned red flannel. And it's an interesting thing that red, this is my grandmother's red flannel. I came across it in the box after we we're going through stuff after she died. But a lot of people believe that, and this is the thing as well, folks, you'll see it later on. St. Bridget's Day is tied in with a lot with St. Blaise's Day and Candlemas Day. There are layers upon layers of Christianity and probably pre-Christian stuff all mixed in. But this connection with the red flannel is really interesting. Red flannel was always put on people's chests. It was always put on people's necks to protect them against cold. And it linked in with this time of year as well, the throat, the neck, coughs and colds at this time of year just when we think we're through winter but we're not right you know even though it's start of spring there's still that thing that there that it could, could come back and bite you right so there's red flannel and you, especially older people remember this the power of red flannel some people put it on their chest kept it worn on their chest more people actually had piece of red flannel that would put over their heads again there's a, a lot of folklore there within in the, in the irish story here actually are some, uh, some photographs or i suppose one of the things which We've all done, We've like I, I can show you crosses here, left, right and centre of different types of crosses we have here that we've made and seen and came across over the years. And you'll see more and more of, of them cropping up. Um, and it's interesting that the narrative that the St. Bridges Cross that we all grew up with is relatively new in the scheme of things. It became really popular with the advent of RTE, that particular one standard cross. Now there's loads of different designs and, and you know what? There are going to be more of them in, in, in time, right? And again, it's all, they're, they're, they're all in the symbols, right? But there's the classic St. Bridges Cross. It's an interesting one actually as well when you look at um, William Green up in County Antrim um, and it's lovely to get the, and, and, the, and, and, and some northern stories here as well or visuals here within this story as well after all she's buried up in Armagh and she's from County Loud is that this is a great photograph by William Green um, and it's probably taken around 1900, 1910 but you've got the little, little corn dot or little harvest bows right but if you look at St. Bridges Cross it's made of straw and it always puzzled me. I remember seeing this years ago. I said, how was there a straw back then at St. Bridges Day, right? And then I, I made one myself. I said, they're, they're nice, right? <laughs> they're, they're, they're a lovely cross, by the way. They're a lovely cross made of straw. But traditionally, they were made of rushes. That was the kind of classic one in primary schools. That was a story. But it's interesting. If any can see this, you'll see why there was, stra why there was straw and, around the springtime. Because these are, car, are, are ricks, uh, ricks for, uh, for oats. And there would have been spring trashings. And basically, it would have been the oats would have been trashed for, for looking for probably for grain, uh, for for grain for the um, for, for for the grow, and um, the, the there, were, there were sheaves left left there. So those straw crosses made. Here's a one a haggard stand. There a there a particular one from South Wexford. There's a particular one from from North Wexford, South Wicklow. And these are a corn stand that would have um, that would have um, stored uh, black black oats um, and oats that would have been trashed in springtime. And obviously, when galvanized came and sheds went. These things disappeared, so they disappeared off the, through the front from the farm and landscape. And as I said to you, there are loads of different types of crosses. Some of you will notice already ourselves. Here's one a neighbour of mine up the road here, Denny Hanlon, showed me. It said it's a Waterford cross, and uh, you can see close to it, it's got these uh, the all the diamonds, very like the Mexican uh, the Mexican eye. It's a very similar similar process of weaving, very very simple. I love the fact that it's made with lollipop sticks. Absolutely classic 1970s stuff going on there, right? Arts and craft stuff. A bit of bit of Sally, a few lollipop sticks, and then your bits of rushes or a bit of straw. I can't, I can't remember. It looks like it looks like straw actually. Nice like straw. I love the photograph of Denny's hands beside the working hands beside the cross. Now the gas thing about social media is that I Denny showed me that last this time last year. He said, "Me, I've got this lovely cross." I'm, gotten ring back in the 1970s you have a, i've still got it hanging in the house and sure i put up the photograph and next minute in the son of this of the woman who made it peg o'regan said to me just that down there that's my mother's cross and it's lovely again back to the women again back to the woman here's a photograph of peg showing young pupils in some school down, down west waterford somewhere how to make these crosses all during the 70s and 80s right so it's incredible and, and, and before that as well so it's interesting the role of women in this kind of el this element of crafts i kind of found here's another from donegal no shortage of my donegal and um, this was sent to me again through just through facebook through social media francis Doherty's cross again this was apparently he's 40 years old and i love the layers of the sellotape and stuff on it as well that's what makes it real you know sometimes we can get very precious about you know the the, 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 the perfect craft but sometimes you know it just doesn't make a difference it's a Look at these roughly cut with a pen knife and chopped off there and broken bits of Sally's. And again, that's all what it what, what it means to you is the, is the important thing. Here's one I would have made with there a couple of years ago with uh, just with rushes. They're grand, they're lovely, a lovely, a lovely cross, very simple to make. Here's a man in Galway actually. He was making them still, didn't learn them from anyone, uh, called Jim Gavin. I was up 
Galway there a couple of years ago recording and Jim said, I was, don't know what I was doing, I ended up in his house anyway, and I noticed this in his dresser, and so oh yeah, I make those, Jim showed me. So there are bits of rushes wrapped around two little bits of Sally's, absolutely gorgeous, right? So there's the back of it, and again, the bit of, the bit of, the bit of cellar tape, lads, so, right? Now I know some people will go mad about, about it, but these, you know, I, I'm, not too, I'm not too bothered, right, personally. Uh, what is interesting here, if you look at Jim's dresser, that was a photograph from Jim's dresser, he's got a piece of blessed palm across here. He's got the classic St. Bridges cross here. He's got a bit of blessed palm over here, over the door here. He had his other little cross in the, in one of the mugs there. And if you look over his head, you see another little cross nailed to the rafters, a nail to his new ceiling boards. And that was a common one I found, that's Jim's one there, screwed, actually screwed to the, to the boards, right? Um, but if you look here, this, these photographs were sent to me by Kate Teesby and Claire of a derelict house near her. And basically, if you look here, there were loads of different types of bridges crosses. So this was a very, very particular design. I've come across them here in Wexford. I've never come across, I've only come across accounts, of them, I haven't seen them. But these are of a particular cross in Clare that was made, made in Galway, made in Mayo as well. And, 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 uh, and uh, where you would actually get a lot of wood and nail it to the rafters of house, always to the rafters. And every year you'd put a new one up, up to the rafters. You all see that? It's incredible. And again, why was it put near the rafters? Most houses were full, of, were, 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 were attached and were protection against fire. All to do protection against fire and protecting the home. So that's the natural place where it went up. Some are more ornate than others, but every year one went up, one went up. And again, someone sent me these, uh, Louise Rose Grave bought a cottage in Clare. And when she went in, she found them on the house and she left them there, which is lovely to see. Again, up and down the doors and over by the door, wherever it was, was one nailed, right? This is my grandmother's house in Wexford, and you can see she didn't get rid of her crosses, she kept them up as well. So you'd have yokes that someone may have bought for her, or yokes we would have made for her as children. And what I've always loved was we made these for our children back in the late in the 80s, and they were made of plastic straws. Now you'd be shot now if you said told someone you were making stuff of plastic straws, but that's what we were making them, probably making them at school, I'd say. But she thought they were the best thing ever because they didn't fall apart. Again, it's all about what it means to you folks, right? And what these things mean to you. And there they are, they're the they're the plastic straws. But if you don't can't get access to rushes, you can't get access to stuff these you know newspaper rolled up this is an artist friend of mine called Quiva Dunn and made these just rolled up newspaper make lovely crosses as well and I suppose it's great if we can see, we're seeing more and more of this you know different types of crosses these are from schools up in up in Loud I saw last year and um, while well, it was over new I'd, spend, I'd go over to Newfoundland a, a bit and they were making the St Bridges cross but they used some of these things um, a, a bog iris and they would make them out of that um, again, same thing made once a year as well. So that's an that's an an, an interesting thing. Um, when when I have you there, sometimes we think that all our traditions started in since time began. And some people love this. Some people want to go back to when oh this was this has been gone pre Christian. This is five thousand years old. But you know what? Sometimes it only started in nineteen seventy four. It only started in nineteen eighty four. It might have only started two years ago. Someone might have ever be, someone might be new to Ireland and this is the first time ever coming across them. It only started in 2022, right? So that that happens, right? And things happen, things have their own time. So so again, um this 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 is this is a woman and a man I recorded up here in North Wexford. And she says that uh, she brought the cross tradition up to where when she married into her farm and that we married a, into a farm up in North Wexford from where she was. And this particular family, she says, I'll tell you, let you hear the story, we're having trouble with cattle. And she brought the cross in and she learned it from, I think it was her grandchildren, but then she liked it and then she brought it on. So there's always the different layers going up and down and ages happening there, right? Again, it's not going back to when time began, right? But it's, what's lovely here is she talks about the power of the cross and what it meant to these particular men, these two, uh, two, these two bachelor farmers, that she, that she tells a story about and about the cross protecting, but also getting rid of evil or bad luck, whatever you want to call it, right? Yes, because my all my nieces and nephews were a bunch of school and they came home with St. Bridges Cross. And I tell you a very good one. A neighbour, a be a cousin of my sister's husband's, Joe Ireton, oh, yeah, came out to visit one night. And he was a connection, close connection, he came out and he would come regularly for a little visit. But he came this night anyhow. How are things, Joe? How are things going with Joe and how are you getting on? God, not good at all. He says, I'm losing a lot of the cattle. They're dying with me. And they listen and how his poor granny was alive then. Well, do you know what you'll do, Joe? Take home a bridge of St. Bridges Cross with you. And uh, Hey, what's that about, said Joe? So the granny explained to him, you know, you, you 
you take this out with you and you put it up in the cow house or wherever in the cattle house or wherever and keep it there. So Joe said, yes, fair enough, he says, I'll do that. So the chat away and had his cup of tea and it was time for Joe to head for home. And Granny says, have you got your cross now? Yes, he says, I have it down here in my pocket. So poor old Joe come on and he hopped up on his little tractor and headed for home. And it was just the two of them in the house, Joe and Robbie, and their two brothers never got married. And Joe would knock around a little bit, but Robbie was a quieter type of man. He would nearly always be at home. But uh, Joe says, I'll go ahead now and I'll go home to poor Rob. So he came in along anyway, and he says, uh, I wonder what will I do? I think I'll hang up the cross first, he says, before I go in. So he went on over to the house and he out to the cow house and he put up the St. Bridges cross. And he says, I'll go in along now and I'll see how Robbie is. So he come in along anyhow and uh, we're talking, talk, talking and chatting. And by and by, there was this awful commotion. An extraordinary commotion went on in the yard, which they never witnessed their experience before. And had an, all the cattle broke out of their bales and out onto the yard and around, and they were roaring and going wild. So poor Joe rushed out and tried his best to settle him down and get him back in. And to the day he died, he would tell you that story. And what he put it down to, he said it was the devil was in the house and he must have been not wanting to go, but they got him out. They got him out of it. He'd say that. He'd tell that story to anyone who come along. Crossing. Now, folks, and they're a powerful story, and it's lovely to see Seamus beside her laughing. That's the great thing about collecting folklore in Ireland, as we'll tell you the most serious story, and then we laugh at the same time, we'll wink at the same time. That's the gas of it. That's the lovely human side of it, actually. So there's a great, those lovely human hu human aspects. Um, gorgeous story, powerful story. And again, it's all about what, what you believe in. But what's really interesting here was this woman got her cross-making tradition from kids who went to school, an older woman, brings it to older men, and they take it on board, right? So that's an interesting just to just see how things bounce around, right? But the gas thing was last September I went to visit the men's house um, with their nephew and they brought me in the old houses up and um and I was taking a photograph of their dresser, right? And if I know so carefully, hang on, what did I see in the dresser? Only St. Bridges crosses. Jeez. And it was amazing to see it because I knew that that cross on those two men's dresser, the men's dresser were still the same as that, since the day they died, was the same cross or or, or from that period. Her, when her story was right, I also got to see the bales where they, where they, where they, where they used to stall up the cattle, and again where the bridges crosses were always put up. St. So Bridget was always associated with the crosses with, with, with protection of, of cows in particular, of, of milk cows in particular, and cows cows calving um, in 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 the, in the months to come. Right, so that's an interesting one just to see that. And come here to me, this stuff is completely contemporary. Like I can go from Donegal to to Calvin to to Kerry or Limerick or Wexford. You'll find lumps of ivy hanging up in people's sheds still, or lumps of holly. Farmers will have stuff like that, throw them up here up to believe it protects against wart, or uh, a, 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 in this case, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's wart, you'll find lumps of ivy hanging up uh, in, in farmyards. Again, cross-religious, just, just people have that belief, right? And it's all about, it's all about belief, folks, right? Um, just when I, when I mentioned about cows there with St. With, with Bridges to you, um, this is actually an image from, Glast from Glastonbury, Glastonbury Torah. It's apparently, it's St. Bridget milk, milking the cows. As I said to you, she's the A to Z of saints, really, when it comes to Ireland, but there's there's, there's reference to, to Bridget, this, big, this bigger Bridget, St. Bridget. Um, also here from Germany, from, uh, uh, again, a stained glass, and you can see this connection with Bridget, Bridget and cows. There's probably beer in the thing down beside her, but definitely cows, and that thing that story is really strong as, as i said to you and again this is a 13th century manuscript from france and again here here's herself with it with it with it with a cow right this story actually when one thing actually I, I i didn't mention there was when the women when the women from donegal were talking actually uh so there's there, there's loads there's loads around bridget but one of the things around St. bridget's eve actually was and it's common in a lot of our E or the eve of any of our festivities like May, or May Day or especially especially on Halloween was the idea of feasting 
Um, and that was a big thing you'll find as well. You'll also find that people actually tended to, the, the poundies as they call them in, up in Donegal, where the pounder was a wooden pounder for mashing the spuds. And nowadays they're all metal or plastic, but the pounder was used, or poundies as they were called, which was a form of called can and sometimes a bit of an onion and butter and salt and milk maybe thrown on top of it. Um, but that was a popular one. I came across people of late saying they went to uh, some convents and with, with uh, uh, and where St. Bridget's Day was marked, it was always a big day for feasting, but that was always with sweets, right? Um, one other thing, which on the eve, I'm conscious of time, we're still okay. Uh, one other thing that I'm con that, that uh, is big is the, as I said, the, the eve of, of, of St. Bridget's Day, that was the, the making the crosses, leaving out your brat breed, that kind of stuff. But also the day itself was a big day. And we have a huge tradition of mummers. Um, and in, in, I'm using the term, term mummers in, in, in the widest sense here, but basically people who would dress up and people who would house call. And it was a strong tradition. Again, you'd find it here in parts of South Leinster and you'd find it a lot in Western counties as well. Uh, Kerry, Clare, uh, in Mayo, of mummers calling around and some people call them biddy boys, some people call them mummers, some call them breed jokes, depending on different names and what part of the country you are. But people would dress up and they'd call house calling on that night. And that was, that's again, very strong. Obviously Halloween is very strong, the same idea of dressing up, um, people calling and getting something at night, whether it's food or getting money, um, I'm playing a few tunes and singing songs, that kind of barter, that kind of exchange, the exact same as the Ren boys. And that wider tradition is very, very strong uh, all over Ireland. You get it in, 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 in pockets in different counties all over the country right but i'm going to let you listen to some women from county mayo just talking about their memories of these mummers calling um if i can see it now i'll be a right fella and if i can't see it i won't play it for you i'll just tell you all about it and obviously no i can't see it it's not there right so they were just talking about these mummers calling on uh st bridget st bridget's night and they had a little verse i'll, show, I'll, see, I'll go back down and show it to you this is one of the little verses that they would have had here was St. Bridget dressed in white, give us some money to honour the night. This is a photograph from the school's folklore, as from the, uh, the National Folklore Collection. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's in Kerry. But the idea of, th there were different types of these house callers too. In Kerry, you would get bands and groups of people and there'd be parades and competitions between each other. The Kerry lads love that kind of stuff, right? But in most of the other counties, I found that there were looser gangs of young lads and loads of girls going around dressing up and calling and maybe singing a song and, 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 and getting something. I was chatting to a man in West Kerry the other day and he was saying that they saw, it, there was mostly girls where he was around Castle Gregory. And he was telling me that when the girls would call, they kind of had it, there was a kind of a, it was a great form of insurance really of getting a few pound because I said, we brought you good luck. We'd always, anytime that these people would call to the house, you would bring you luck, right? And, and if you didn't call, you'd get bad luck, right? And usually you wouldn't call because you wouldn't get anything. So people would call and they'd always get something. So it was a great way to get a few, great way of getting a few pound. But that tradition of, of these mummers calling out as city is strong. It still goes on. Here's a, here form a photographs from, there's a Homer Sykes photographs of, these are from Kerry as well. Again, this is from Kerry as well. What's really interesting, and again, to point out to you, you look at the old 1970s kitchen cabinet thing behind that kind of before just the, the thing that came after the dresser. But if you look here as well, when you look at this, straw hats, plastic masks, bits of paper masks, dressed up, pajamas, right? That, 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 that kind of get up, right? And that's an interesting thing just to sometimes what, what's great is there was a non-uniform. And that's really, really important as well. Sometimes a non-uniform. Now, again, it depends on pockets, but from any of the people who are going to individually, like at Halloween, you dressed up, cover yourself up with whatever you could find, right? I was sent these images here um, and uh, just, 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 uh, just, just, to, just today. Um, and uh, there, there are images from uh, Claude Kilcoyne, and these are from uh, Kilorglan. Um, these were taken in 2007. And they would have a strong biddies tradition, biddy boys tradition, where different villages would compete against each other. Uh, Connor Brown sent me these photographs. These were where they would actually dress up and I said, this is a very strong carry this idea of the competition. And some ways the competition keeps it going because one village is trying to outdo the other village and trying to win the prize. Um, and that's an interesting one. You'll see that cropping up. That same kind of tradition of that competition is very strong in Kerry, even around the Ren boys, while other parts of the country, it's more looser, right? In some ways you can see the competition thing has kept the thing alive in, in some ways in an odd way, but they're just powerful images. And what they would do was they would dress up, they'd have a little effigy of, of Bridget, and they would dress up in um, sometimes a little, cro a little crosses on them. Sometimes it could be a doll. Some of, some of these would be have been made in the late 1800s. Some of them were using real human hair um, and were brought around. Um, I'll show you different examples in a while. But these are the ones. These are the ones from Kerry taken in 2017. It went on again this year as well. But just powerful. And again, 
the marking of the cross on the on the, on the face that was very uh, a, a, a strong thing in it. Again, the competition side was very big with Kilgovenet. Kilgovenet, I think, did it this year as well. COVID got in the way in the last two years. Here's some photographs as well to show you Biddy Boys. This is I love this photograph. It's absolutely wild looking because it's John Heaton up in leash and a man that I know up in leash, and he has a pub, and they used to always have a Biddy Boy dance a couple of days, maybe the weekend after St. Bridges Day, but it was always a big hoolie before Lent started. That's the other thing to bear in mind. Lent is coming around the corner, folks, right? And this was where men and women would dress up and just get get, get drunk and have the crack and dress up again, make and do, which is absolutely lovely. You can see it again in like 70s masks and tights and whatever you can get your hands on, right? Um, when we're there, when we're talking about kind of breed ogs, um, this is a and this is a fantastic image. They were sent to me. Uh, they're, they're from uh, Darius Balan in, uh, in 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 Clare. This is a little breed dog that she made. It's just absolutely powerful. She connected with a woman of Ninish man back in about two thousand and three, I think it was. I'm oh, sorry, 2008. And this was one of the last makers of these particular dolls. And she got him to come over to the scanner and the, the local priest put him up in the church and said about 50 people got together and they all made these based on this one woman, what she remembered traditionally making. And these were dolls that were made very like the photographs that I showed you. And were usually with the lash, with a sheaf of corn that was left over from the harvest that was untrashed. And the, she was described it in a video I saw recently, where it said that the head was bent around, and the, and the, and the um, and the, the head of the, the head of the, the the oats was in the belly of of the of the little doll, and she said it were usually made by the youngest the youngest child a child in the house the young the child around could be 10, 12, that kind of age, and usually with the mother. And then what we do is the children would get ribbons out of their own hair or get ribbons, whatever they could get, little ribbons they could do and decorate and put little crosses on, on them and little crosses on them. And this is direct from this woman called Maureen Cornelia from uh, Inishman, showed, uh, showed Dara this and the people in, in the scanner. Absolutely fantastic looking objects, right? And great to see them. Look at this. Gorgeous. And these were brought around like the ones in Kerry. And, 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 and again, I've come across this in Mayo. They were brought around that night showing here is St. Bridget dressed in white. Give us some money to honour the night. And sometimes I had other, other things as well because Chris, Chris, Breed, my Chris, little, little, little verses. But they're just lovely, lovely little things. And again, I love the, the idea of just the craft and the making and little bits of jewellery put on them as well, right? Um, there's a Chris breed actually. It's a it's a another, another thing. It's just a barely touching it with you. Uh, it was just a a, a little uh, uh, a circle that would, people would would, would uh, step into and, and would and step out of on St. Bridges Day. Now it's done in parts. I think it's done in the scanner as well over in that part of Clare. Obviously the scanner for any of you that know the scanner has got St. Bridges well, a very very famous well in 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 Ireland, right? Here's the little ones that we would have made with, with, with Granny at home. And she was making these little ones with, with, with us. And again, these were just made at the end of the night when you'd make your crosses as children. And these were little leftover rushes. But again, we call them breed, breed, breed dogs. The name probably, we, we learned the name. But the little craft aspect is lovely. Nowadays, I put a little bit of the rag cell on them. But they're a lovely thing to do with kids as well. This idea, you get your few leftover rushes, tie it, and put your little arms across it, and then make your little figure. I remember Granny used to, and again, the, the gas thing is, no matter who makes them, they'll always make them differently. That's that's the brilliant thing about them as well. That's what's lovely about crafts and making and being creative. I always remember Granny at home, was she'd always cut out the heads of maybe a local person which you might find in a paper and you go into the dresser and you see this on the dresser with the next door neighbor's head stuck in stuck into it. Um, so another another layer. So St. Bridget, the woman, I suppose, so a man from Gory was asking me the other day, he said, There's no statues to Bridget around. And I was going, I said, Do we need statues? Because I think St. Bridget in some ways, or Bridget, whatever you want to call her, she's in her head, she's in her heart, and she's in her hands. Um, and uh, so that to me is an interesting one, you know, we don't need these physical representations of her. Now, there are a few, you'll get, there's a St. Bridget's cross up in Cabinteely in Dublin, to say this is St. Bridget on the cross, I don't know, it could be a male monk, but the story was this was St. Bridget's cross in Cabinteely uh, in Tullo in, in, um, in, in, in South County, Dublin. Well, it, Recently, I only came across this myself, like the, uh, actually a physical representation of Bridget. You will find statues around the country, rare enough, right? But this is down in Spain. This is down in the middle of Spain. And uh, there's a feast day down below there. Now, obviously, her, they said to Bridget, uh, I think it was our skull was uh, was uh, was dug up in the 1300s, brought down to Portugal. But for some reason, this middle of Spain, outside Madrid, they have they, uh, they celebrate Saint Bridget's Day. They celebrate it. They take the statue of Saint Bridget out. They bring her all for a parade around the town, the usual Catholic kind of parade kind of thing. This is the village. Um, I, I did a post on the folklore page there two weeks ago, a week ago, about, about this, right? Um, but the, the gas thing as well, they have, uh, there's a lot of uh, protection of, of stock. And um, they also have things as well around the poor. Bridget was a great, 
patron saint of the poor. So what to do on that day is to make this kind of a bread and they have it with cheese and they give it out to the poor people. And nowadays, I think they make it out and everyone gets it. But at the end of it, they have this really unusual tradition where they have an auction where the well-off people would actually donate gifts that would be auctioned that night to pay for the food that was made to feed the, feed the poor people. But I saw a video of it and it's like a parish field day here. You know the kind of field days where you have the wheel of fortune and all the kids go mad at the bottle bank. That kind of vibe going on, right? Um, but it was lovely to see. So there St. Bridget marked on the 1st of February in, in, in this part of Spain. And obviously she's marked as well down in, down in Portugal where her relics, they said the relics of St. Bridget were brought in the 1812 something or other. That was a kind of co a common kind of practice. But one thing actually um, that was happened was they brought part of her bone back to um, Kilester up in, into Dublin in the 1920s. And this is Kilester, I think it's Kilester Church. Um, and this, there's great footage up uh, of, of, on British pate of this. This is the foundations of the, of the, of the marking out of the church that you just you just saw there, and the the, the, the bishop was walking around, and um, he was blessing the he was blessing the first block, putting a sign it across in the first block. And uh, there's two or three really interesting videos there. One thing which will strike you, and this will strike you, obviously here it's very male, right? And I suppose I'm glad in some ways that 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 has changed, you know, for, for me because Bridget to me, and as, as as you saw in most of the videos and the stories I showed you, there was a very strong female presence there, and there wasn't room for Bridget in that in in in, in that part in, in 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 the Catholic Church back then you know um, even there's very a lack of nuns there you can see that right so that's an inter an interesting one to, and one to, one to just to, just to look out for right but to say her, her relics are still in in dublin um they're again brought back brought back and I'm, I'm near i'm getting near the end here i said i'm giving you a quick overview folks right but what's really interesting for me i suppose are <sighs> I, I, I'm huge interest in the holy wells i'm interested in those places i'm interested in empty fields uh, rather than the big official buildings and huge cathedrals and that kind of stuff I suppose it's not me it's not it's not in my nature uh the way I was reared um and it's lovely to see this is a man I know called Derek Ryan it's lovely to see in the last year last even two years of people going god must mark down all the same bridge as well as in County Tipperary and here Derek did this and I think we'll see more and more of this and I'm hearing more and more little stories around St. Bridget cropping up from around the country and more and more of that will happen and that local thing is so so important in this right here's the St. Bridget's well again there are many St. Bridget's wells all over the country this is the St. Bridget's well here in um, our tram and here in, in Wexford near Castle Bridge and it was it was always there used and like most of our wells they just dropped in the 60s 70s 80s 90s and a few men and i think there's a couple of women as well but there's a couple there's two men one man called matt murphy in particular they drove it and they cleared this up and they got St. bridges well open up again they cleared it up during covid and got it going it's interesting even seeing the statues that we will use of um, this one it's like, it, it, it is st bridget uh we're, we're told anyway because the cow is there and the book is there and, and, the, and the staff is there there's a lot of confusion between mary and bridges mary and bridges sometimes so it's lovely to see this representation of bridget there again our wells are you know we need water lads we need water to live here's one thing actually i'm going to show you this is a photograph that was taken in 2010 and myself there to be curly head and the other half of my late father and uh what there's a holy well in a place called kiltress that he and my mother they all used they're all local people who lived there and they, they used this well actually the graveyard was 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 cross was catholic catholic protestant but the church site was, it was just again layers of history there but the well was there and there were two wells a drinking well and a water well and i remember mammy and daddy bringing us there as children but you're come here to me it just it was in the middle of nowhere cattle were left in on it and it just it just faded but he always knew where it was and even i remember i remember my own grandmother was dying on her deathbed, you know what she asked for? She was 103 when she passed away. She asked for water from the wells that she drank of as a child. And that's a powerful thing to be able to look for that, to go back to ask for that. So she asked for water from, from this. Now, this was, we couldn't get, we couldn't get water from this for when, when she passed away. But that's what she asked for because it was gone. But what was lovely was the plan is at some stage to, 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 to clean it up. And I suppose now we've never been in a better time to do it now. But it's, it's, it's amazing to see that, that how these wells, these spaces, were so important, especially the country people. I'm not saying all, not to townies either, but especially the country people. These places that you went to, it wasn't a big cathedral. It was a corner of a field where you went and you reflected, where you left your thoughts, where you we, you asked for 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 something, you left something, and there was a they were very very important. And there's more and more interest in those spaces now cropping up. And again, loads of people use them. What's lovely as well, as you can see, was there's no shortage of rushes there in in, in this particular well. Um, and it's in, it, what always struck me, remember that day was my own father digging down hitting the, knowing where to go to a corner of an empty field and knowing where to prod uh, with a spade and hear the flagstones and then to dig a bit 
and get the water flowing again. So there's going to be loads of that. There's going to be loads in the next couple of years. Again, there'll be more and more of it. Again, if you type into our fantastic resources here with bluganim.ie, we can look at all the place names with bride in them, with breed in them. We can look at them all over Ireland. We can look at them all over. We can look, we go to, we go to England. We can go to Germany. Well, I, I, well place sites or churches associated with Bridget. But you go to place names in Newfoundland and Canada, the States, Australia, New Zealand, and you'll find Bridget's loads again would probably would, would relate it to the, to the nuns, Bridget Ian nuns, the 1807 and that foundation as well and, and they're part of that that story as well. Um, I'm going to get near, near the end with you. One thing we must never forget, folks, in the story of Bridget is the story of light, the story of the fact that if you look out your windows today, you realise one thing, or you realise that the mornings were getting brighter and the evenings were getting brighter. Light was back in our lives. And again, in the classic layers of, of, of all our beliefs, we have Candlemas Day, no surprise, two days after St. Bridget's Day. And Candlemas Day, for so, those who don't know, was Best candles were blessed, candles were blessed, throats were blessed on St. Blaise's Day the following day. But there was a load of rituals around light and candles, right? Here's photographs from Newfoundland. This, this tradition was done here in Wexford and Waterford and faded away, but carried on in Newfoundland. Here are on they get a blessed candle and they would light the blessed candle and they would drop four drops of wax onto their chainsaws, onto their boots, onto their tumble dryers, and they'd always say, Name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. And those four drops, and you'd mark them for protection, those four crosses that cross there on your on your stuff. And lo and behold, here's a neighbor's shed in Ballygarth in Wexford. And when I go out to the shed, what did I find? The blessed candle. The blessed candles were you know, came across accounts. I've never seen it done of the wax dropped on the back of a cow at this time of year. But some people would always use the blessed candle to go under the belly of a cow. Um, when the cow would be calving or you know right some people would also say that could have been there because electricity was gone and if electricity went to the candle there there's loads of reasons to look at it but you'll see that that, that same pattern of the, the power of the blessed candle and it's no surprise right little verses for you folks right was here's a great verse you came across you come across it here in the southeast but again in newfoundland where loads of southeast irish settled and things survive uh, you get versions of this half your prog which is your provisions half your hay eat your supper by the light of day and we had these little verses in our heads so we'd know what time of the year it was and that we knew that we'd have our half our provisions which are for food and half our hay for our stock and then we could eat our supper with the light of day. Here's another one, a neighbour, a woman that I only up the road from me, she only passed away, called Mary Deegan, told me last year and she had, she said, oh, my father had just saying, Mick, she says, a candle must play, throw the candles and candlesticks away and eat your supper by the light of day. Light was coming back in our lives again, folks, right? And there's loads around the weather folklore as well around Candlemas Day. If Candlemas Day be fair and bright, winter will have another fight. But then again, to say if Candlemas Day brings cloud and rain, the winter will not come again. So it's a bit of a 50-50, lads, right? Depends on who you're talking to, right? Uh, here's another lovely saying around Candlemas Day. And Candlemas Day, a good goose will lay on, but on Valentine's Day, any goose will lay. I'm still trying to read and talk to myself. Um, but one of the things which is really important and as which you will notice is we'll notice there's life. We notice the snowdrops are up. We notice that the daffodils are out. We notice that lambs are out in the field again, right? And I'll end with this for you. I was going to show you. We've got we got a, a little lamb for a pet lamb for our children here. And she was born on the 1st of February last three years ago. And she needn't guess what she was called, right? So there is Bridget, right? And Bridget has been uh, the, the, the life and soul of, of the party in our house for the last three years now. You wouldn't bring her in these days. But every year the children will make little little cakes for her. And she likes she likes waffles and she likes take different things but it's lovely to even have that 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 um to that 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 thing in your, in our lives whatever and you'll notice it yourselves anyone especially the country ones you'll notice the lambs in the field or even bringing in and beforehand um and here's another little poem i'll end with winifred let's for you and winifred let's again she was spotting this 110 years ago folks right and it's a lovely one about um the uh noticing St. Bridget passing. I'll just read the first line. I thought the winter lingered still, so harsh and humorous in the wind, but Bridget of the blessed name has passed and left the lambs behind. Their little voices made a song that drove the winter from my mind. And on that note, I'm going to end this talk for you folks, and we'll hand you over the column and see if there's any questions you want to ask and uh, on, on what I've just chatted about. Absolutely fantastic, Michael. I really enjoyed that. Um, the um, just the just when just the bit you touched off with the um, the holy wells, and I have noticed that we did a talk actually on trust in it here last year with Rosaline Durkin. Uh, she's doing a fantastic project, um, uh, trying to make communities aware of holy wells in their area, and uh, they're actually restoring some of them, particularly up in central Wicklow. There's a holy well close by to me, and you drive past it, you never see anybody there. Uh, you never see a car or anything ever parked there, but it's always minded. And you saw there's a little child of Prague just um, 
just left there as well. You see these little tokens here and there, and it's 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 a uh, it just shows the speciality in certain places, like these quiet places as you call them. And um, with the world gone so hectic, it, it's great in a sense to see the people are actually going back, and uh, maybe to to these sites and uh, just look for those five minutes of peace and quiet and maybe to have, instead maybe uh, maybe the prayers are gone but maybe the 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 moments of just uh turning off one's mind or something like that it's just that's it's been embraced now which is great to see um we have some questions here michael um from jane mcnally uh, there's a tradition that saint bridget's crosses uh, to protect against fire uh, that's why my mother started putting one on the electricity meter board. Uh, she says, here in County Derry, the tradition was to leave the leftover rushes lying on the floor for a bed uh, for St. Bridget. And in the morning, they were swept up and added to the bedding in the buyer and the stables for a blessing to the animals. Gorgeous. And what's lovely there to hear that, it's lovely to hear that story from Derry. Um, here in North Wexford, we've, this is, I, I took me, I, I had to go 3,000 kilometres to find this outside of Wexford. Now it's great to hear someone from Derry doing it right as well. When the old people, when the electricity first came, they were afraid of their lives of it, right? Honest to God, they didn't know what this is voodoo for them, right? No, this kind of crack, right? And uh, I've seen in North Wexford, Bless Palm put over the fuse boxes. Now, any electrician will tell you that it wouldn't be a great place to be putting a piece of dry piece of uh, uh, dry piece of fire, fire palm, right? But that's where I've seen it. And I couldn't find it in any other counties. And I went to Newfoundland, and here's the gas thing. And I was in someone's kitchen, and I was looking, I saw, I don't know, it's a fuse board. And I, said, Gee. And I couldn't, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really interesting one, actually how things because here's the thing right the ones predict from this community went out late 1700s to this part of newfoundland right so there'd be no one coming back over those 250 years give or take right okay but still they did it now i don't know whether it was a, a strong catholic thing that they had but they had this fear of fire and they did the same they put the blessed palm over the fuse box again so it's this inherent kind of thing it within within people you know for protection um, and it's really interesting to, to, to figure out in Derry and I'd love to figure out was it done by the neighbours was it done in that one just in that one family um, so that's the, that's, the, that's the great thing about this old gig you know things like that can knock you so that's lovely to hear yeah um, right just oh, we just have a few questions here people are very interested to see when the video will be uploaded so um, we made sure to tell them that uh, to check out the Trust in Assyria YouTube channel. And also, for anybody here that's, that's been unfamiliar with Michael's work, he has an excellent page on Facebook called Folklore.ie and also the website www.folklore.ie. Uh, you'll see a vast, and I mean a vast collection that's been carried out by Michael over the years and it's superb. It's absolutely immense work, everyone. So please follow Michael. Uh, he's doing excellent work in preserving our our folklore and customs and even the sayings i love i love the sayings you do often put up yeah yeah and come here what's lovely about as yeah. well, the, the likes of column and, and doing these talks and things like this is that we can access people that we never would have accessed before you know that kind of way it's lovely for people to come in from different parts of the country different parts of the world um and to see stuff that's real and it's not it's not polished it's not produced for television and that's what's lovely uh, lovely about this and that's always been a great thing about history talks anyway is you get that lovely detail but that that to me that to me is lovely about the, the, my own folklore.ie page if i put up a word like your oxter someone from county antrim will go oh we use the word oxter or someone in county Clare will use it as well you know so that's what that's what that's what's great about it in the world that we live in you know we can we can we can make good use of these jokes you know this kind of way we can put them to good use yeah I, I, it only sort of dawned on me, you know, when I was when I was living in the west of Ireland, and people used to be mocking me with my accent. It was a bit of a slow accent, and like you were, you were mentioning earlier about the East Wicklow and North Wexford accent being similar to the North, and uh, with my own accent, it's more like a Carlo accent. But the, the 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 certain words like that's real bad. Is that meant to be like old English that's been passed down? Is that the last bits of old English that we that are still in uh, that can be found in, the, in in Irish accents? Is it? I yeah. wonder. Like particularly this being a bit of a traditionally a long term English planted area. Would it? Yeah. Like, the 70s? yeah. You get, you get, certainly you will get little examples of old English, but certainly middle English, and you'll find those lovely middle thing, English terms. And again, this is great that connection to, to, to up to the north, like door for door, floor. Uh, cold, uh, hate, uh, mate, 
oh, like if Shakespeare came back, he'd be delighted with himself because all those those pronunciations had died out over in England and changed and you know became gentrified with the, with bowel shifts and things like that. Well, they all survived over here. And then they got kind of the, the sad thing in some ways is we were baiting about children in school now and they're all picking up these mid American D four. Don't get me talking about accents and lots of accents. Because accents we are they're, they're, accents are telling you know they're really they're incredible you know. Um, but yeah, so th- 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 those words are incredible you know. Um, um, and they're, they're, they're great ways to connect us. But Ireland, and again, you go all over the country, but definitely you'll find it in Wexford, you'll find it up in the northern counties. Uh, even with traditional singing, I find my other half would work with traditional singers. The Wexford ones will gravitate to the northern counties for songs, you know, with all big, the big, long English language ballads. You can get them up in Fermanagh or, 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 or Derry, or, you know, we'll always have that connection. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's an in, interesting time and interesting words and loads of dots to be joined. Yeah. We have uh, from Breed here. I'm very glad I tuned in tonight to see and hear your most interesting presentation, Michael. Bridget has been drawing me to her wisdom for over the past 20 years, and she's not going away. Um, make your talk and delivery such a great link in the chain of traditions, old and new. Love this. Thank you. Now, from Lena Hughes. From um, Kim O'Shea, speaking of women, but straying uh, away from Bridget, the 11th February brings St. Gobnus to mind. Is there any folklore traditions related, related to her uh, that you might mention for a moment? Oh, God, come here to me. I was only texting a, a woman in Kerry. Uh, sorry, in Kerry, she has no cork yesterday. And when he's talking about her, St. Gobnus was to say the sister of St. Abbon. And Abbon here in Wexford, St. Adam's Town, and there's a, literally there's a, there's, there, there is, there's, down in Ballyvorney on Friday, um, there's a gorgeous marking of, again, this is this was new to me. The, 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 there's a statue of St. Gobnet. The locals will come, they will kiss it, they will touch it. Um, and they have these things called measures, she was telling me. They're about 12, 13 inches long, I think they are. And they're little ribbons that the, you will cut to the measure of the statue and you will wrap them around or wrap them near it. Gorgeous traditions around Ballyvorney sit around St. Gobnet. Very, very powerful figure down there in the folklore. But listen, the gas thing is, there's a hill near me here, about three miles away, and was was called Gibney's Hill. And they said it was a St. Gobnet and a bush there. So these early saints, these figures, you'll find that in Irish folklore, they, well, the cult of the saint, or even whether they always said that the saint passed through there, you know, the kind of way St. Patrick was some man. Um, but they said that the cult of that, you know, you'll find loads of spots with that name, you know, like St. Senan in County Clare, you get St. Senans here in, 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 in Wexford, you get St. Senans down in Cornwall, I think you get Senan in Switzerland as well. So these these movement of our early saints were always really interesting. Um, but Gobnet's gorgeous. If you're in Ballyvorney at all on Friday, apparently, um, it's, it's, it's the place to be. Yeah, we have, our, our local saints is that we have St. Finian, St. Finian who, who, uh, who ended up going to Clonard. We have St. Moog from Farns. And it was actually customary for people from particularly in Clonmore and County Carlow, they used to do the uh, the trek down to Ferns on the feast day back, uh, I think that was up to the 1940s or 50s. Uh, and then we have St. Fieck. And St. Fieck is not really traditionally based around South Wicklow. He's more County Leash, uh, Greg Cullen, Carlow Town area. Yeah. Um, he's the painter. Uh, he's a painter. The, the French taxi drivers have statues of him in their, in their car. Um, he's okay. uh, he's also got a connection to yeah Saint Fier. Uh, you, you'll see his place name in Brittany. There's a couple of Saint Fierkers in, in Brittany still. Um, you, 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 Brittany in particular, you'll notice a lot of our, our early saints. We have Saint Bock. Saint Bock was from South Wexford. Uh, well, he did. So the name is from South Wexford. Saint, Saint Box. Saint, there's a couple of Saint Bock Box in Brittany. Versions of them. Saint Fierk. Saint Fierk. I think the, he was the uh, patron saint of. Ta- not taxi drivers, whatever the, the early taxi drivers were in Paris, and I think still to this day, Parisian taxi drivers will have a little st- little thing for him um, uh, as well. And there's a boring piece of information for you. <laughs> um, from Tom Feeney, absolutely loved your talk. You and your family are super. Uh, thanks so much for all your hard work. Uh, it, I'll have to uh, actually, uh, to add on to that, just from following your post, like, your children actually have the perfect childhood. It's it's amazing, like the interact or the the inclusion that you, how you bring the girls into all your um into your work and just it's just very enjoyable. Like instead of the PlayStation or, or being stuck inside playing with the with what everyone else is playing with and stuff like that, they're actually participating in 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 the stuff I would have loved to have done when I was a kid, you know and. I'm actually jealous. Um, right, where are we now? Aaron, Aaron Dolan, very enjoyable talk. Great, uh, Michael. Liam Shortle, um, 
he has a St. Bridget's well in his canoe, he says, well worth a visit. Brilliant one, yeah, it's a gorgeous one. Um, and by the way, that man from Liz Canner there, if he's listening still, there's fantastic photographs from the OD collection of 1950 of that well. I was only looking at him recently and the well was much bare. It's interesting just to watch how the well will, you know, it'll, it'll change with movement of people and people coming in and putting, adding things to it. They're on the National Library website uh, from the OD collection. They have... I think your internet's gone, Carl. You there? So, folks, I'm not sure if you can hear Colm Liam. Can you hear Colm? Um, yeah, I, I think I think yeah. Colm, we might have lost Colm there. So yeah. um, we might just leave it there, Michael. Perfect. Lovely. That's yeah, great. Thanks, thanks, thanks so much. Very enjoyable lecture. Really enjoyed it. I learned a lot about St. Bridget. And uh, thanks so much. Brilliant, lovely. Thanks a million. Take care, everyone. Thanks for coming. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.